Thank you very much for inviting me down. The center is magnificent. Congratulations to all of you. I know how much uh, some California group has yearned and longed for the center, and to actually pull it off is remarkable, especially given the Northern California group where I live, who can't even find a place to rent. <laughs> uh, so, but this is just just a wonderful, absolutely bomb's gift. Now, speaking of the you know, tonight, actually, the confluence of three of the world's major religions uh, going on now between uh, Hajj and Mecca, uh, Passover and Easter. Become a worldwide holiday the way these are now. Uh, Pat wanted to remind me, which I told him about, about, that 15 years ago, Pat? 16 years ago, something. Pat and I traveled to Kashmir uh, after Mirabat closed at Easter time. So we went, we had, Erich had given me this book called Jesus Died in Kashmir, which Pablo, of course, said was true. Uh, and when we were in Srinagar, there is what is reputed to be the tomb of Jesus. It's called Ruzbag. And there, there are caretakers there who uh, have been caretakers in the same family for generations. And it goes back to nobody knows when. Uh, and it's sort of this, the way I remember is that it's very much sort of feeling like this, with this very long table in the middle, covered in an old musty cloth, that they say is the tomb of Jesus. Now, Baba said that when Jesus died in Kashmir, it wasn't in Trinidad, but in Harbon, which was about seven miles away, Mountains. The Baba, in the, I think in the 30s, pointed out to the Westerners where the spot was, uh, but it didn't get recorded. So it's somewhere in Harlem. Uh, the, uh, and the, going with it, there was also a, a Christmas story. In 1966, Nick Hamilton and his ex wife Ursula and I took off with Baba's permission to spread his message about drugs to the young people on the road in Europe and Asia. And as the timing would have it, <coughs> ended up in Jordan at Christmas time. And about Christmas Eve day, the three of us climbed the Mount of Temptation outside of Jericho, which is where Jesus uh, was reputed to have fasted for 40 days and nights. Uh, and spent the entire day sitting on the, on the top of the mountain. <clears throat> uh, and so they spent Christmas Eve in Bethlehem, uh, where there is the, uh, there's now a humongous Greek Orthodox uh, monastery and church built over the site of what is supposed to be the manger. And you go down several levels uh, in time and distance to get to this little spot uh, which, where, the, where there's a star inlaid on the floor it was supposed to be the exact spot, I don't know how they know, where Jesus was born. And in order to get in there, you must crawl through what is called the door of humility. And it's called that because the door is about this high. And the only way in is to bow down. Um, and then I recall we spent New Year's Eve at uh, camping out of the Dead Sea in the caves of Qumran the lowest place on the, on the earth. So that was, that was a Christmas story that kind of reminded me that it was an Easter story. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I'm reminded, sitting here, of the first time I ever gave a Baba talk, which was in New York City. And the, uh, the story of that was that just before I left India from seeing Baba, no, I will that track, uh, I got a cable from Baba telling me that as soon as I arrived in the United States, that I must go see Fredella Winterfeld in New York immediately, which I, which I did. And while staying with Fredella and feeling somewhat overwhelmed by their loving kindness and generosity and uh, effusiveness, not to mention the fact that it was Christmas in New York, 
and they have all these people over, none of whom I knew, and all of whom were similarly older than I was, except the Love Brothers, uh, who were really something in their late 20s. Uh, the, uh, they, Fred told me that I had to give a talk at the Monday night meeting at 57th Street, and I said that I don't give talks. Right? Said, well, I would be very unhappy if you don't give a talk. And I said, because you must, you know, we've just come from seeing him, we've been waiting all these years, and so I got talking to him. So we went to the, uh, the place where they had the meetings on that Monday night. And I remember John Bass was, was there, he was sort of the, uh, the MC and also standing guard. Um, John was quite a character. Uh, you know, know yeah. And they did a meeting for the discourses and so it was it was like it was a it was a room full of middle aged people, mostly. People at my age now, not all of us. I was yeah, more great <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so and so I said, well, come on, Dreyfus, now it's your turn to talk. So I got up in front of all these people, not knowing anyone there. And I looked around, and feeling very shy, I said that the journey uh, to meeting Meher Baba was a journey from here to here. And thank, so thank you, and sat down. And, oh, and for that, there are no words. That's <laughs> <laughs> great. So Fred said, that's not enough, Robert. You know, <laughs> So I'm not knowing what, really what to say. I, I got up and said that I, what, I, what countries and places I went to, and, and how did you get to Baba? So I told them that physically how I did it. Uh, and that was my first Baba talk. So it was, it was uh, a weaker effort that I found out that I'm capable of. I'll give you a more full version of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, in, I learned of Baba in the winter of 64-65 from a, uh, in a mixed media event called We Are All One. And there was a big Dave poster of Baba's face from the famous picture of Baba with a garland, a three-quarter view taken in Washington, D.C. in 56. Uh, apparently, it's the most popular Baba photo of them all. Uh, and it was on, and I wondered who this was, and I went and asked, and was told that this was a great uh, spiritual leader in India, the name Baba. And uh, I was very involved uh, with Rick and with Alan in Cambridge in those days. And, uh, we were all earnestly seeking. Trying different things like yoga and Vedanta and Sri Ramakrishna meetings on Sunday mornings, Gurdjieff and all sorts of things. So Ramana Maharshi. Uh, and then we all sort of found out about Baba at the same time. And all came to Baba at the same time. And one day Rick and I, that spring of 65, uh, we were going to visit Alan, who was then a graduate student at Harvard. And went over to his office, and on the door to his office, he had a card. And on the card, it said, to penetrate into the essence of all being and significance, and to release the fragrance of that inner attainment from the guidance and benefit of others, by expressing in the world and forms, truth, love, purity, and beauty, this is the sole game which has any intrinsic and absolute worth. All other happenings, incidents, and attainments can of themselves have no last Mayor Bob. I stood there and read that several times. It was very moving because it seemed to me that in one short, extraordinarily eloquent paragraph, Baba had expressed what, what it's all about. What, what, what we're here for, this is what there is to do, and this is the only game worth playing. Uh, and nothing else matters. And we went into Alan's office, and on the uh, wall over his desk, he had a, 
the universal message taped to his wall were the ones that were originally made for the uh, uh, this gathering in '63, the World Fair in New York, with a, a Sandra photo of Baba in the middle, and seven realities in a short bio. And I looked up and I said, Him again, who is he? And I said, well, that's, that's Mayor Baba. Oh, incredible. He said, Are there other books? And I was told, Oh, yes. So now picks up a, gives me a copy of The God Man, Barnfield Baba. And I looked it up to the photographs. And I saw these photographs of Baba from the time he was a boy until, uh, must have until the East West Gallery. And uh, I was very struck by his, his appearance, by his photo. And when Alan told me that Mayor Baba had been silent by that for 40 years, I was very moved and very innocently interested because of reading in. Uh, Particularly in Lao Tzu, where he says, he who speaks does not know, he who knows does not speak. There was this man who didn't speak, and seemed to smile most of the time. It was, it was more than intriguing. Uh, and immediately after talking with Alan, I uh, went to the library and found a copy of the Godman, which, by the way, Phyllis Frederick had donated to the library. Uh, so the links began early. And in reading, I took the God Man home and started reading it. This was in the early spring of 65. And about halfway through the book, knew that without question, the Bible could only be who he says he is. It was, it was so clear to me that the thread of truth that I had discerned in reading Sri Ramakrishna, particularly Ramana Maharshi, that, that the Bible wasn't venturing opinions. That this was, he was, that what he was giving forth was from the truth and was given with such authority it was unmistakable. And then, if that were the case, and uh, he were wrong with the truth, and his asserting unequivocally that he's the avatar meant that he could only be that. He could only be who he says he is. And it was like a window opened in my mind. And it was, uh, I remember getting up in the mornings after that, just looking out the window and you know, they saying, Joy, Joy, Baba, thank you, you know, thank you, God, for Baba. And of course, what that meant for me at the time was that Baba was in the world. He was in, in, in form in India. He, it was, he had a memo to him later, I was glad that he had an address. Uh, and, and Try to me that I must go see him as soon as possible. It was about that time that Rick had just come up from uh, New York and he had met a few of the Bob people in New York and told me that there was a, he was going to be showing a movie that Harry Kenmore was supposed to be a movie about it that I want to go. I thought, of course. So Rick and I hitchhiked from Boston to New York, 120 miles, to see our first Bob film. I think of that now when I know. Street. <laughs> Sent to see one, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the film was shown at Harry Kenmore's place. But Harry, of course, was blind. He himself couldn't see the film that was being shown. Uh, and I thought I enjoyed that, and also the thought of a blind man going to be with a man who didn't speak. <laughs> intriguing <laughs> concept. <laughs> <laughs> And was very moved by the film, and at the film learned that there was going to be a Salvas in Christmas in 1965. That Obama had called the Salvas uh, originally in, to May for the Westerners, and Bob had switched at the last minute uh, and changed it for the Indians to come in May, and for the Westerners then to come at Christmas. Uh, and the people in New York were chartering a jet to fly to India for the Salvas program at Christmas time. And I asked well, how much is it going to be? It was $600 for every day. And I said, how long will we be in India? And I was told, well, about 10 days. And I thought to myself, I said, that's absurd. I said, spend all that money and go to India for 10 days? And that was, I was in love with India, with my idea of India, which is a lot of Indian music and Indian philosophy and Indian art. 
poetry. And uh, I wanted to go to India for a very long time. And so I decided that let them fly. I was going to go leave earlier and go overland and get there for the service in December. So consequently, uh, I left the United States on September 1st uh, with a one-way ticket to London. And then went out of my thumb and started hitchhiking to India. Mm -hmm. uh, determined to make the few hundred dollars that I have last as long as possible. I figured if it's a hundred dollars, I could probably last at least a year in India in those days. The good thing is I wasn't going to pay for transportation. So uh, I took off and started heading east. And of course, encountered as one does while traveling, particularly traveling uh, hard way, one accomplishes oneself in the process of going where one is heading towards. And in this case, of course, I was heading, I hoped, you know, to meet Bob, to meet Mary Bob. And as, as I traveled, it became clearer and clearer to me that I was, after all, a pilgrimage. And being a pilgrimage, uh, implied for me that there was certain a certain amount of hardship was necessary to make it a juicy pilgrimage. Make a long time ago. And what I decided for myself early on the journey was that I would experience as much as I could what I referred to as intentional suffering, and uh, with as little comfort as possible. <coughs> Everything I read about pilgrimage, that you had to work hard to get to, to where you were going to the goal. And I thought that was only appropriate given that I was going to the source of all goals. So I decided uh, well, actually, before I left, that other than flying across the Atlantic and getting across the English Channel, that I wouldn't pay transportation anywhere on route, and thereby uh, maximize the small amount of money I had and stay in India as long as possible. Not knowing, of course, what Bob had in mind. So, for the next two and a half months, I traveled overland to India, most of it on the tops of trucks. Which is one of the ways you were. Uh, a bit bouncy at times, but wonderful. And came you know, sort of face to face with uh, opportunities to surrender. You know, as much as it meant going through some of the difficult parts of the Middle East and other places, with very little traffic at times, and spending all day in a place where maybe four trucks came through. Not knowing where one would sleep or eat or when, uh, it was an interesting exercise. And I had with me uh, in my knapsack a few holy books to leaven my soul with uh, God Speaks and Bao Tzu, and even the Gita. However, uh, you know, I still was having to face my desires uh, as I traveled uh, to and through myself. And this meant in those heady days of the early 60s, uh, a certain amount of herbs, potions, and elixirs that Baba had not as yet spoken or given any statement about. And though I'll, I'm going to try to get a more fleshed out version of the Sabbaths, uh, nevertheless, the skeleton of it is that as I was going east, um, being in Istanbul, and being told that war had broken out between Pakistan and India, and that the land border was closed, there was no way through. <laughs> That's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I looked, you know, pulled out my maps and looked at um, other ways to get to India, overland, of course. And I heard that there was a boat that went from Mombasa to Bombay, 
and then I could go down to Greece and <coughs> catch a boat across uh, to Egypt and then go down to Sudan and Uganda to Kenya and catch the boat there to uh, Bombay. And as I was doing my homework about this, learned that there was intertribal fighting with Sudan and that you could get through, but you had to post the cost of shipping your body home in the event of a <laughs> problem. <laughs> Maybe this is not the right way to go. <laughs> so I thought, I will just continue east and see where it takes me. And I got to Aleppo, Syria, which I remember was one of the oldest cities in the world. They were hugely distinguished in the old bazaar that there was a sort of leaning clock tower with uh, four clock in each direction, all four sides, and none of which tolls the right time. Uh, appropriate somehow. Uh, in Aleppo, I met someone who told me that there was a ship that one could ostensibly catch from Kuwait to Bombay. And you could go to deck class. Deck class was as close to a enduring hardship, and even though I've been paying a little bit of money, that it was, it was roughly equivalent, particularly that was the only apparent way to get there uh, from where I was. I decided that I would head towards Kuwait to find out about the ship. But these are big distances. There's deserts in the Middle East are there. And, uh, from Aleppo to Baghdad is about 700 miles in, a, in an apparently straight line on my Swiss map. There's a red line. Uh, and that meant instead of going down, it's a triangle going down from Aleppo down to Jordan and then going across along the pipeline road, that it was a line you could go like this. And, skip one part of the triangle. And so I decided to take that route to Baghdad. And put on my phone, hitchhiking, and I got a ride and found that about 40 miles east of Aleppo, the road stopped. And that for the next 700 miles, there was a dirt track. And so the bulldozer had gone through and pushed a few rocks out of the way across the desert. That was that was an interesting journey. Uh, I remember getting dropped off at the border of Iraq, and there was, a, which was, there was no man's land, about seven miles across to Iraq, walking, walking it into this tiny little village, which was the border. There were no guards, were people taking a siesta. I had to wait several hours for the inspector to wake up to get a stamp on my visa and my passport for Iraq, uh, and then wait for a truck. But eventually got to Baghdad and then on to Kuwait. And uh, I had been told that you know, so much wealth in Kuwait, that they were very generous, the best uh, tradition of Islam. And I took myself to the Ministry of Education in Kuwait and said that I was a wandering scholar and could they put me up. And I, I had a, actually I had a visa. A student visa in my passport because I had applied to Benara Student University as a way of getting a student visa so I could stay in India longer than a tourist visa would give me. So he took a look at it and said, Oh, yes. And gave me uh, an empty woman's unused schoolhouse to sleep in on the floor. Uh, and I found out that indeed there was a ship. However, the ship was at that time detained for cholera, a quorum shop, um, <laughs> and would come sometime. Uh, as the days passed, waiting for the ship, the other hitchhikers started to appear in Kuwait because they had come across the same circumstances as I had. The border was closed between Pakistan and India. This was the only cheap way of getting across. Uh, and several people ended up staying in the schoolhouse. It was all, all Europeans uh, traveling across to India. I remember one man in particular who was from Austria, Max, who was a great character, a huge guy. And uh, he was a bit of a rascal. He had, uh, he didn't, there were no Austrian consulates anywhere, so he had to go all the way back to Austria. Renew his passport and get visas. So he had his own stamps made and would renew his own passport. <laughs> <laughs> but he would wake up, every morning he'd wake up with a big laugh, just laughing with his huge, valuable laugh. I say, what's funny, Max? He said, oh, just think of the millions of people all over the world going to work right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So I think it was the characters were meets. Uh, so I went to the, the shipping line, which is British P&O, and to buy a ticket for the, uh, for the ship, and was told by the uh, shipping agent, who was British, uh, that I said I wanted to go to deck class. And he said, no, it's, it's not done. Westerners don't go to deck class. It's, it's for the, the Asian peoples. But uh, I said, well, I, I prefer to go to deck class. I said, well, you know, I had to, so I had to sign the forms of my duplicate saying that British penal lines were not responsible for my body or goods. Mm-hmm. Um, and eventually the ship did arrive. It was, it was good, about two weeks waiting for it. And uh, was taken out by a small boat out to the ship and found a place to sleep on the deck with about, with about a thousand Indians and Arabs on the deck. And I remember it was $40 for the eight day trip, including food, which was nothing to write home about. Um, mostly rice and gristle. But, uh, and the, the Finally, getting on that ship, everything was crystallized for me. Because I knew that when the ship docked in Bombay eight days later, I'd be in India. I'd be that much closer to Bob physically. And until that time, I had, with increasing mental difficulty, been taking opportunities of being in the Middle East where certain uh, smokable, altered consciousness uh, chemicals were available in abundance, mostly in the form of ash and so forth. It's sort of like the fantasy of people back in America, this is the land of plenty, uh, at the end of the Yellowbrook, Yellowbrook Road. Uh, but, you know, as I was trying to come to terms with what I was doing or where I was going and sitting in trying to read God Speaks, and, uh, it was obvious to me that uh, drugs, which have been around since the beginning of time, uh, that had they been of assistance uh, as a path you know, to God, that they surely would have been recognized by now. And the, the, the very omission of that as a Surefire past to the truth um, made me think about it more and more. Um, and again, you know, keeping for me in mind that, you know, that I was on pilgrimage. And this, this internal struggle kept increasing. And it was what I referred to uh, as the post I was writing the seesaw of hypocrisy. On one side were my good intentions and my holy books. My aspirations on the other side was you know, a pound of ash and uh, <laughs> jealousy and whatever yeah. desires. And the, the this ride was uh, becoming insupportable. I had to find balance. And that first night on the ship, lying on the wooden pole of this deck, it was a sleeping bag, <coughs> as the ship left port, and the, uh, we were floating on the, on the, uh, the, Persian, the Persian Gulf. There were a billion stars in the sky. There was no moon. And because, of course, it's just desert and water everywhere, there were no lights whatsoever. So it was this unimpeded view of the night sky as one could possibly have. And as I lay there floating and looking up at this extraordinary amphitheater of stars, I had, I suppose we'll call it described as an epiphany, that uh, where this small dot of light over the ship would, would disappear uh, in the vastness of everything, it was totally so insignificant. And then in fact, this, this speck of dust floating in space called on Earth would vanish in the infinitude of everything. It also wouldn't and because it wouldn't matter, because nothing really mattered. The only thing that made any sense, the only thing that didn't matter, was to try to love and serve one's fellow beings. 
That was the higher ethos that gave meaning to life. And with that, the next morning, woke up, got rid of both sides of the seesaw, gave away the passion, life, and all the rest of the stuff. And for the next week, sitting on that ship, read the Gita every day, and God speaks. I just had to prepare myself for where I was going. On the ship, I met a young Dutchman who had been to India before, was on his way back, who had spent time in the monastery, the Tibetan monastery in Darjeeling. And I was going back there, and I was uh, felt that by that point, after being on the road for months, uh, sleeping on floors and so forth, that I was very tired and uh, thought that how nice it would be to go up and sit in this monastery rest and get my strength back and maybe even finish God Speaks um, before the Sabbath began. This was the middle of November and the Sabbath was not ostensibly until Christmas, so I had about five weeks and I thought that uh, I was going to spend three or four weeks and then come down the Sabbath and uh, see Baba then. So the first night uh, we went to Gurdwara, the Sikh temple, where the tradition of hospitality continues, where they will put up strangers at no charge. I slept on the floor of the Sikh temple in Bombay and was just overwhelmed by actually being in India. I was dreaming of India for such a long time, to, and of course, the length of the journey and the means of it. Prepared me so that you know, the, the India was just, just, just extraordinary. And knowing that Baba was in India. And so, sleeping on the floor of that room, which was about a fourth of the size of this area here, with about 40 people sleeping on the floor, getting up early in the morning and going out to this little balcony and looking out at, you know, at India, the you know, cows in the streets, and you know, sleeping on the sidewalks. Burning incense in the trees, you know, the of garbage, the whole works. It's going to be a max. And being struck by that if Maya is everywhere, then this is Indian Maya, which is the most potent enchantress in the all. And then what I needed to do, without any further hesitation, was to go to see Baba as soon as possible, immediately. There's nowhere else to go, nothing else to do. Go to Baba right away. And I figured that if I could, I could, because uh, I'd seen the film of the East West Gathering, putting out the Handals and the Shamiana and all the workers that were needed. I had a few weeks that I could help yeah, learning the small in the art of the um, So I immediately got my knapsack and uh, caught it. Local commuter train, for which I did not pay, uh, to the to the main road, which Tana, which is the road going from north to south along the west coast of India, uh, as that was the way to Pune. And uh, went out on the road and we started to pitch up this way because the other side of the road. Was. And across the road from me were uh, two Indian gentlemen sitting at a little folding table. Uh, and they said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Pune. I said, yeah, okay, you come here. Turned out that they were truck inspectors, and all trucks going by had to stop and show their papers. I said, we'll get you a ride, don't worry. So I came and sat with them, and they got me a ride, and the truck went to Pune. The truck, however, was totally full with the people in the front, and it was a huge truck uh, covered in tarpaulins that was carrying furniture. They told me to go up the top, and right on the top of the truck was a huge overstuffed armchair. <laughs> <laughs> and I sat in that armchair all the way to Pune. <laughs> to the very top of this truck. There was the only part that wasn't, the only one that wasn't tied down with tarpaulins. Just the very part of the top of it was tied down. And, uh, and watched India unfold. Like, my first day in India. <laughs> Uh, and then got dropped off when 
we got to Pune. Not, I didn't know anything about Pune really, except that Baba had been born there and lived there as a young man. And uh, his biology was there, but that was my extent of my information about Pune. Uh, so, I remember a few travelers trips by then. I went and dropped off my knapsack in the first class waiting room at the train station, which would be a safe place for them to carry it, and set out to explore Pune. And eventually it turned dark and I was hungry and I walked into the restaurant and was sitting there and ordered some dinner. And a young Indian man in a western suit came over and started to talk to me. And I just happened to talk in the Middle East of people being curious and friendly and wanting to get as much information as possible from you. What you're doing, where you're going, and what is your father's native religion, yeah, what is your native village, and so forth. Um, he started asking me questions. I really didn't want to be bothered. And he said, Where are you going? <laughs> said, I'm going to Amanagant. Acha, Amanagant. You're going to see a philosopher, is it? I said, No. Said, Where are you going to see? Perhaps you're going to see Meher Baba. I said, Yes. He said, Acha, when you finish your dinner, I'll take you to the new Meher Baba Center here in Pune, which I didn't know existed. Baba had just opened it in May when he had the uh, Eastern Rasavas. So after we finished dinner, it turned dark and he took me a uh, short stop at the Lakshmi Temple, so good luck, uh, to the Baba Center. He said good night and wandered off into the dusk. And the uh, Pune Center had a little office at the side of the building. And I saw some lights. It was dark by then. And I went in, and there were several Indian men standing and sitting and talking, and this one that sort of appeared. And one man, the man was sitting with us, and he said, Yes, may we help you? And I said, Yes, I've come for the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was here early, and I thought perhaps I could help him. He looked up at me and he said, Surely you must be joking. I said, No, I'm not joking. He said, but you see, Baba's castle is not us. He takes out a circular showing me that on September 4th, Baba canceled his office. It's out of the country September 1st. Nobody knew where I was. That's why I didn't find out until I got to put it. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, surely you must be joking. He <laughs> said, I've come halfway around the world for this. I must see Baba, but you cannot. He's in strict seclusion, he's not seeing anyone. I said, where is he? I said, he's in Marizal. In strict orders, no one can see him or have any communication with him. I said, but I must see Baba. And they didn't really quite know what to do with me. So they <laughs> said, somebody brought me over to Baba's brother, well, job at Baba's. As I spent the evening with Jao, we took me to Baba's house too, and so forth. And uh, I don't think Jao quite knew what to do with me either. He said, First thing in the morning, you go to Nagar and see Ali Kiyarani. I said, okay. So I went back to the train station, slept on the floor, the waiting room, and got up early the next morning, and for the first time, other than the ship across the Persian Gulf, paid for transportation. I took an ST bus from Pune uh, to Nagar for about 50 cents. And uh, that once I get there, I didn't want to wait for a truck. I needed to get to Nagar as soon as possible. And, uh, I got off of the beautiful downtown London bus station, which we call it the and started walking in my knapsack. And I said, you know, all I knew was I had Adi's address was King's Road. So I saw someone say King's Road and said, we're going that side. I just kept walking. Kept walking and walking. It was hot, it was dusty. Uh, and I asked someone, you know, we're going that way. <laughs> As all of you know, India is such a polite, wonderful, kind people. They will give you directions even if they don't necessarily know where you're going. And so I ended up, I did end up on King's Road after walking down this path. The pave became gravel and became grass across the Nella and up over a bridge, and I was in the middle of the army camp, <laughs> which is King's Road. And it goes up to Gilles, where I was immediately surrounded by. Indian Army. <laughs> because I thought I was a Pakistani paratrooper. <laughs> 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 there were more. 
And so they took me to this place to question me. And uh, they spoke with English. <laughs> so we were going back and forth about this. And then, yeah, I'm trying to show my American passport. Um, and then a, a man came by on a bicycle who uh, saw a commotion and spoke English. And I told him what was going on. He knew Adi and he told me, he explained that they let me go. Did you just go back this way, this King's Road? If you stay on it long enough, you'll get to the body of here on his office. He took me there. So uh, we walked to Adi's office. Adi was sitting at his desk, there's some paperwork. And he looked up at me and he said, hey, Look, uh, Ty, why don't you go wash up? We'll have some tea and talk. And so I was telling him. I, you know, I told him my story, basically, and uh, a, while, a little while later, while we were having a cup of tea, I looked out into the trust compound, and I saw my knapsack being tied into the back of a motor scooter. I said, I don't this. He said, well, you see, well, you cannot see Baba, because Baba is such a seclusion. You've come so far, uh, and, you know, you're in so much hardship that the man really want to reach you. I said, wonderful. So I was taking Camilla's out of the back of this motor scooter. And when we entered the dirt road going down to Mira's out, I think this was Lost Lane. And the feeling arose me that if I could see Baba, how wonderful. And if not, it was his will and I would wait until we called him. And, we, and, uh, and when we got to Marizad, there was, of course, no little side road where the bus goes now. There was, no uh, there was just the green gates, yeah, which were closed, of course. And, and I remember looking at seeing the gates in the entrance of the compound of Marizad. And what went through my mind was from uh, in Zen, they speak of the gateless gate. Through which one passes and leaves one south behind. And that's, this was the gateless gate. I was brought in, and of course, when Mao was inclusion, the Mandali was inclusion, nobody came and went. It was very quiet. So they, you know, hearing the scooter, everybody knew that something, something, something had happened, somebody had arrived. And I was brought over you know, uh, to the men's side and shown a little bench to sit on in the shade. Which is still there, uh, and just don't sit there. And a few minutes later, a quiet, soft-spoken, gentle man came over, introduced himself, sat down next to me, and said, "My name is Eric. Who are you?" And he said, "Tell me what, how you come to be sitting on this bench. What brought you to this bench?" And so I told him my story, everything, unedited. He just listened. He wrote, he had some papers in his hand, and he said, well, just sit here. Uh, he said, he had to go see Baba, he had to pick up Baba, he'd come right back. And he just said, rest. And so he, he went off, he came back a few minutes later, he had a big smile on his face. And he said, I have wonderful news for you. Baba will see you in the morning, and he wants you to stay here tonight and sleep in the blue bus. Mm-hmm. And he tears. And so I was Eric introduced me to the Mandalay. Uh, and we went into his cabin and I remember go here at Mani and Mano, along with Francis and Eric and uh, several of the others uh, all crammed into Eric's room. And they wanted to know how I learned of their beloved. So I started to tell them my story. Actually, that was the first time I told my Bob's story. And there was a, uh, And I got to this part about, I mentioned Alan Cohen, and the said, oh yes, we just got a letter. Uh, and he ran off, he knew where it was, and he came back and gave it to me, and started reading it. And it was a letter that Alan had written to Kitty Davy from Millbrook when he was under the influence of LSD. 
saying that here he was in the sixth plane of consciousness <laughs> and how wonderful it was, and where did uh, LSD fit into the spiritual panorama? And of course, Kitty had no idea whatsoever what he was talking about <laughs> and sent it to India. So they asked me if I knew what LSD was. And I said, uh, yes. Um, well, what is it? So I told him that it was this you know, drug that a very small amount of it. Some people experience altered states and consciousness and all that sort of thing. And I remember Gilbert particularly started laughing her head off. I mentioned that I mentioned that in Boston I had to that we had called it reality capsules. <laughs> and she started cracking up, she said, only in the West. Only in the West. She said, these people have spent their whole lives with Baba, sacrificing themselves at its feet. In the West we discovered a pill and taken 20 minutes later, one of us. <laughs> So they asked me, said, did you ever take this? And I said, uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, I'm to And I hide from it. And, uh, and I had this image, I remember, of like this giant karmic snowball starting to roll down a hill gathering speed. Uh, well, what was it like? So I explaining that it was my own subjective experience only. Uh, I started describing you know, what, what I experienced at LSD, but because it all stayed with consciousness. And right about this point, Erich stepped out and I had noticed and came back in. So he stuck his head back in the door. And she looked at me in total innocence. Asked me, Baba wants to know if you'd like to see him now. <laughs> As if I say that's why I'll wait until tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I so said, of course. So Erich took me to the Bible man's side. Around the gate, you know, where the gate is, and back behind where Mommy had an office, the, the smaller house, to Baba's bedroom. And I remember when we approached it, the door to Baba's bedroom was open, and Baba was seated on, seated on his bed. We went right up to the bottom of the three stairs to go to the bedroom. And I remember he was sitting there. With the sandra down to his waist because it was hot. There were a couple of people in the room with him, I don't remember at all anymore. And all I could do was look at him, and there was, he was just beaming. Just absolutely beaming. And I just, I couldn't believe it. I was there, seeing him. And you know, all the yearning and you know, the longing and the suffering and the, and the hardship that, that I was actually with him. And what I saw looking at him, well, I'm not giving the missions at all, is that I saw, I saw this extraordinary effulgent light emanating from him in all directions. It was brilliant, more brilliant than a thousand suns, with his face at the very center of it beaming. And the, the light was so intense, tears were just streaming down my face as a physiological response. And Bob started gesturing, I was just standing to my left and kind of thinking Bob was gestures in English. And Bob said, I'm happy to see you. And I remember thinking a little of my mind was left working. He's happy to see me. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm tired and dusty, and I should have a hot bath that afternoon. That I should read a certain section of God Speaks that day before the sunset. My first words. There was a section on Fana and Baka, and God speaks. And I shall good dinner, get a good night's sleep in the new bus, and that he would see me in the morning. And I didn't say, I didn't say a word. And of course, Baba had so It was basically a dialogue in silence. Eric was the only one talking. And Eric sort of turned me around and led me back up to the men's side, and of course, I followed Baba's directions. Kind of like, you know, bumped down there. In the bucket bath, this hot water was my first hot water in quite some time. Uh, and then had dinner with the men, and we were getting into some discussion with Francis about uh, we both love Chinese poetry. We used to talk about Chinese poetry for a while. I mentioned something about what was wrong with China, was too much Mao around the Tao. Which he enjoyed, but he said, that's not the correct pronunciation of Tao. 
Yeah. Zoom is it? You still have more fun. <laughs> um, as if it mattered. Uh, and, you know, sat talking with Eric and uh, as I said, meeting the other men in Kaikaban, Badu, Haka, you know, these wonderful old disciples of his, and uh, uh, and then I went to a, you know, sat down in the courtyard in the Chicago chair, and my copy of God speaks with me, sat down to read the section of Baba Kobe Kri, Baba Kwan and Baba. And I remember being struck by Baba's timing, Baba's perfect timing, because as I sat reading it, and I was coming to the end of that chapter. I was also coming to the end of the amount of sunlight by which I could it. And there was just enough light left in the day at that moment to finish the last sentence of the last paragraph of that page, and no more. Another, another page in the dots. I was struck by that. And then we had dinner and uh, talked, and I said, I think of that. Showed me into the new bus, um, which of course was a bit emptier than. Now, all that was in it at that time was a cot that Baba had used uh, himself during the great seclusion. And nothing else was in there, and I was struck again by Baba's timing and generosity. Until that point, for well over two months, I'd only slept on floors, small floors, on which wouldn't hold the ship. The first bed that I was sitting in. That entire voyage was Baba's own. Early the next morning, Eric woke me up at five. Uh, and Percy Land was, was going to sleep then. It was up. Though it had been wired. But Baba got the property in the late 40s. He had Padre wired for electricity. Uh, and hooked up a generator, had it run for about an hour or so. Baba told to shut off. Voice the generator. It was never used again until the film was found. So, and I was thinking, like, you know, how Baba made the wires. It was all, everything was ready. He bought it, was turning on the switch. And that's his work in the world. Everything was wired. Waiting for him to turn the switch. Um, and, you know, it took me when we washed up at breakfast. And at uh, that, uh, the nurse said, Now it's time for your sons. The Darshan of Baba. And took me into my little hall. Everybody else had brought in my knapsack, a small knapsack, really, and put it next to me on the floor, across from Baba's chair. And I said, Eric, why are you bringing my knapsack? I said, I just wanted to show Baba how little you brought with you. There was no Indians traveled, big bag boats. It's huge amounts of stuff in my And it's still a knapsack. What Eric didn't know until many years later was that also in that knapsack I did have two doses of 100% pure Sandoz pharmaceutical LSD. I remember Bob hadn't said anything yet. And uh, I had such experiences under it that I had this fantasy of going up to Nepal for New Year's Eve, bringing in a uh, So that was brought into a lot of the before. And at that time, Monthly Hall was a little more austere than it is now. The uh, cushions and the carpets, and, and there was none of that there in the Monthly Hall. It's not on the floor, it's a little bit of like, 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 reed matting. And I was shown a place right across from Bob's chair into the wall to sit. Uh, and all the Monthly came in, and it was Bob's. At that time, during that seclusion, which he spent in his room, and would, every morning he would come to the hall, uh, walk from the hall two or three times for his exercise, then sit in his chair and uh, deal with the whatever you know, news of the day that presented itself, those robbers and workers. Uh, and then he would go back to his room and stay there until the next morning, the seclusion. Uh, so as I was sitting there, a lot of other places. Uh, the doors to the inside opened. Around the hall, and 
There was Baba and Sadra and his hand on Francis' arm. As soon as I saw Baba, I immediately stood up. Baba looked at me, just waiting for me to sit down. And then he walked away from the hall two or three times. And I remarked as he did so how very sweet it was that Baidulin had had a beard in that time. Baba stopped and tugged Baidulin's beard. Very caressed in his cheek. And I just thought it's beautiful, so intimate love play between the divine beloved and his fortunate slaves. And they ordered their lives to it. And then Baba came and sat down in the chair. We all know him so well. And then he looked at me. And he gave me a gesture that cursed him down and translated with this. And I got up and took those few steps to infinity and bent over Baba, who was seated in the chair on his left side. And Baba reached up and embraced me and kissed me on both cheeks. And I kissed him on both cheeks. And then he, he, he bowed down to me. And I knew from the you know, that Baba Bhakti, that we were years at a time of knowing the Baba and Bhakti, that Baba was so different from different people in different settings. Baba is a bow down. So I bowed bow down and put my head on his feet. As I did so, I looked up and out of the corner of my eye, I saw the hem of his sock. What came to my mind was cold fast in my mouth. And I reached up with my head on his feet and grabbed the hem of the sock. And that's how many lifetimes I got there to get there. And then I just if we could still sit down. And uh, he started gesturing and Arch was sitting in the corner between us and Translated about gestures into English. So I just sat there, just looking into his eyes, just staring into his eyes, feeling that this was my real self made manifest. Looking through his eyes, I was looking into who I really am, and wanting as much of that as possible. And Baba gestured and said that I'm in strict seclusion. No one is permitted to see him. You are blessed to be. Bob asked me for my health notes. He asked me how he slept. And I said, fine, Bob, I won't. This is a very restless night. Give him what we're waiting for. Bob would put his hand on his palm, fingers on his palm, so, you know, how, how are you? I said, have a little tummy trouble. Bob made a gesture to go here. She ran out and came back a minute later with a pill. Bob put his hand and gave it to her to give it to me to take. Uh, and and then Baba uh, looked over at me, and I had several weeks of fear at the time. Anyway, I don't know, I'm the lion's shape. I don't know, I said, well, Baba, there I was traveling across the Middle East, you know, shaving only with cold water. One day I asked myself, well, who am I shaving for? The camels? So I stopped and said, said it was okay. <laughs> um, and then <laughs> Baba asked me, he said, have you read God Speaks? I said, I mean, sorry, he first asked if he read Stay with God. And I said, no, no. And he had just shared Francis two minutes later, I had an autograph copy of Stay with God. He said, if you read God Speaks, and I said, I've started several times, but he said, very good. He said, uh, he said, read God Speaks again and again. And he made a gesture like this until you feel it singing in your veins. And he said that he went on to explain that there are three types of conviction in the existence of God. There's intellectual conviction, which you can gain by reading God speaks. So this is not of your conviction. Then there's conviction through sight, by which one sees God face to face, everywhere. But there's still a gulf of separation. This is also not the true experience. He said, the real experience, uh, a conviction of the existence of God, is by knowing oneself to be God as God. He said, how do you gain this experience? He said, 
I surrender everything to my feet. You can give everything to me. All your thoughts, words, and deeds. Lay them at my feet. They look at me and say, One day you will see me as I really am. But unfortunately, I didn't ask for it. So mm -hmm. I'm waiting. <laughs> as we all are. Then, uh, Baba says the universe and all its affairs is nothing into nothing, which Harry said is nothing squared. <laughs> <laughs> and Baba looked at me and he said, Is there anything you want to know? And I said, No, Baba, there's nothing I want to know. He said, Very good. He said, You've had enough of words. He says, anything you want. Um, you have to put us in context. But there's no room for thinking about this. It must be spontaneous. If you have a few hours to think about what, what, what do you want uh, from the creator, it could be, you come up with something interesting. But, uh, it was, I said, yes, but I'm just going to walk. He said, and I said, I want to see you and everyone and everything always. And to love you as you should be loved. And to say you love you. That was a very good want. That was a want that we had all wanted. He said, how do you get this frame this intense love that you seek? He said, again, I lay everything to my feet. Give me everything to me. He said, now we're talking. And he looked at me and I was almost a bit fidgeting. I was sitting on this uncarpeted, uncushioned floor with my feet tucked in, my ankles following me. And uh, Baba said, put out your feet. Put your feet up, be comfortable. And I knew enough of my means that one never put one's feet towards the master of his worst sacrilege. Uh, Baba looked at me and said, be free. So I stayed free for about 30 seconds. Uh, and then my feet back over there. <laughs> and then Bob looked at me and his face grew more serious. He said, Are many young people in the West taking drugs? And I said, Yes, Bob. And of course, it was nothing. It was 65. Tip of the iceberg. And he said that if young people who must continue to take these drugs, it will lead to madness and death for them. And I remember sitting there feeling that that was the top of the Because it was so much not yet the case. He said that many people in India smoked ganja, grass, drank bong, and uh, drink made from, from uh, marijuana. They saw visions and lights, forgot their problems for a while. But everything was waiting for them, and nothing. They hadn't changed at all. He said the drugs are a delusion within illusion. They're harmful mentally, physically, and spiritually. And I was very struck by that. And I knew, of course, that they could be harmful mentally and physically. Um, but Baba was saying that they were harmful spiritually. And that was something that I'd never come across before. It was very, very struck. And it's also just you know, historically the perspective that I was coming out of the early 60s, which was, you know, as we all know, a very transformative time in our culture. You know, in Vietnam, you know, the war was happening, the you missile know, crisis had occurred. None of us were very certain how long everything was going to last, but mildly. Um, and so taking drugs was just like, you know, why not? It was a way of trying to make sense of the insanity of the times, assassinations. Kennedy, Kennedy was part of the king. It was a remarkably intense time to be alive. And so Obama said that the approach of Obama was spiritual. And he said that if God can be found in a pill, which might tell us be, then God is not worthy of being found. And he told me to, uh, he said, when you go back to the West, 
spread my message about bucks to the young people that I knew he had this horrible image standing on the soapbox and hate. Mayor Obama says, of course he's done a little more finesse than that. But this reminds me that when I go back in the West, that uh, when I first sat down across Obama, after he said I was blessed to be there, he stated, go back to the West, because what you are looking for, you will not find wandering in India or sitting in monastery in the Himalayas, which of course is exactly what I had to do, and not said a lot of But you will find it in society with people by trying to be a service of the So, so much for uh, and Baba looked at me very seriously. If, if you could underline in silence and emphasize it, this was definitely that. No drugs. Strong lessons. Uh, and Baba. Uh, continued and gestured, said, now there is no need for you to go visit saints or shrines. The shrines or tombs and go to see yogis or saints. Now that you have come to me, he said, I am God, my word is truth. And then gestured to me to embrace him again. Which of course I did. And that was my doctor on the bottom. Somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes. Takes time to as the gestures. Um, what I felt being with Baba at that time could have had multiple layers, some of which only emerged over time. What was immediate was a feeling of being totally accepted for who I was and was not. And the being that loved the people. Really, I think for the first time my life, that, and also feeling in Bob's presence this dynamic love emanating from him, and this sense that this was as close as I had ever gotten to the reference in the New Testament to the peace that passes all understanding. That wasn't something we understood. And afterwards, we left Monday Hall and Erich, we had to, virtually I put it back in memory, um, sat down and wrote everything down. Fortunately, so that I can come and tell the story. Um, and he came out and he said, Baba wants you to go to Maribad today. I have you to take you to show you Maribad to go and see this uh, tomb shrine. And he wants you to stay here again tonight, sleep in the bus again, and then to leave tomorrow. I was, I was very happy. So I got driven to Maribad in Bob's car and to, to meet Padre. And uh, he gave me a, my, my first tour of Maribad, a couple of hours. We went up the hill. I remember Matsari told me years later that she saw me that day with Padre. Uh, and stayed back in, you know, back in her area. She knew that Bob had said that it was only to be with Padre. I remember when Padre showed me the, the Samadhi. I remember wondering why Baba had wanted me to see it. And of course, it was empty. Um, it was a, you know, a building that figured in Baba's history remarkably. Uh, Baba spent so much time in there fasting and breaking the Pramashram days, seclusion. And of course, I indicated that's where his body should be placed when he dropped it. But that was something that was many years away. Here it was empty. And I wondered about it, and it wasn't until going back again, 69, to the great Darshan, seeing it being there with Baba present, that I understood how much he filled the tomb with who he is. And then I went back, driven back to Marizan, uh, 
And at one point, Monty came skipping home to me. Uh, she was only in her late 40s, about 47. And she said, Baba wants to know what mood you took to get here. So I had my mask with me, and I took them out, put them on the table, and took a magic bark and pen and drew a line to all the cities and countries and so forth. She went happily skipping off and uh, came back a while later with a handkerchief that was still damp. She said, Papa wants you to have this. And he just wiped his face with it. He his face with it. Papa wiped it. He was too long. And she told me that she had spread the maps out on the floor in the living room of the lady's house on Bobby's day. And Baba and Mayor and all of it were there. And Ronnie was like, well, Bobby went here, he went there, and he went here, and he went there, and so forth. And Baba said, tell her I was with him all the way. Oh. And I think of that now for all of us in our journey to him. Remember that. You've been Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Once a year to India, the British ship that had the British officers and Indian crew that came once a year to India to Bombay and changed crews. <coughs> and they wanted to get the ship. Um, uh, so I, Baba, when I left Amazon, Baba gave me very strict instructions on what I was doing. And he told me to stay in Pune for five days with K.K. Ramakrishna, who was the head of the Pune Center. So that I was not to go out at any time on the streets of Pune alone. So I see with Ramakrishna in this little stone hut. Uh, and before he went to work in the morning, he would drop me off at Baba House and I spent every day in the job. He would take me around and give to you and so forth. He would me. And then Baba told me which train to take, what time to take it. And I was to go then to Bombay uh, to stay with Nariman and Anabas, uh, which is also where Katie was living, and, uh, until I left India. And I had to wait two weeks in the Bombay for the ship to come. Remember, it was an 18 day voyage by Aden and up to the Red Sea to Port Said to Channel, Italy, for 165 days. <coughs> 165 dollars. Uh, four decks down. No more, no more deck. Uh, it was, if you think that the steerage of the Titanic was bad, you should see this one. It was, uh, this was four decks down under the water line with uh, ten bunks with chain to the inside of the hull. Uh, which, that's where I slept. That's also where Paul Smith and I met, which is a whole other story. Australian Bobo. Uh, and people always ask at this point, what did I do with the LSD? Yeah. <laughs> as I stood at the back of the, uh, of the ship as we were leaving India, watching the receipt, I remember the LSD and decided that I had flew into the ocean, fearing that everything comes from the ocean and should be charged uh, And then I was on that ship for 18 days. And but just before I was leaving Anubhaz's house in Bombay, <coughs> literally, as I had my hand on the doorknob, I had something on my back ready to go out and be driven to the docks. It was a knock on the other side of the, the door. And it was a uh, postman bringing a cable to the bottom. Bob's timing again. And the timing was that 
Yeah, Kim said that as soon as I, as soon as I got back to America, that I was melted to dilly dally. I was straight back. I was to go see Fred Noah there. Uh, and so I went from there on the ship, and then put the 18 days on the ship, landed in Bach in Genoa, and then caught a flight the same day, and went back to New York. Sorry, back there. But I just remember something else. Baba also asked me while I was with him what work I'd been doing in the United States. And I mentioned that I worked in a mental hospital on a war with Hans Hesphrenus in Boston. And Bob said it was very good work, even all the work he had done with the MAG. Uh, and, and when I got back to the United States, I should go back to Boston to that hospital and work with those patients. They would work through me a little bit. When I got back to the States weeks later, I called the hospital where I spent the summer working with my India and I found out that they, uh, somebody had just quit and it was a job opening and was I interested in coming back to work there, which I did, of course. So at, at some point did, did Bob tell you to change careers or? Did you, when did you, because you're not still there. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, oh, it, it was a, it was a, a research project. Oh. It was, it had nine nice months more to go than it was over. Oh. We didn't see the photos getting around there. Yeah. Did Baba give you any other specific orders than the ones that you just got at Marathon? Uh, well, of course, about spreading his message about drugs. So you, you, you did that? Yeah, so, you know, I got together with, with uh, American Allen and gradually others were drawn into that work. As Baba said in the, in the late 60s, he said that spreading his message about drugs was the most important spiritual work at that time, which indeed gave us great import. And so, the, as the other younger people were being drawn into Baba's love orbit, they started becoming involved in the doing that work, and that's spread across the country. Um, and in fact, I remember one time, in 67, uh, getting a letter from Baba and asking me to write down the names of people who were most significantly uh, devoted to that work, with their names and addresses, which I did, and uh, sent that on to Baba. And that was, of course, a whirlwind. Part of which Bob was saying here. Mm -hmm. so, so she first heard Bob's name and one was Bob. Well, actually. Well, no. no it, that always gets confused. I, I, I met Alan a few months before I met you. Ah. Yeah, but he was doing the very same kind so, yeah. of thing, although that's not quite how it right. So we were going around you know, giving talks in churches and schools and colleges, radio shows, TV shows, and anybody that would listen. Hmm? Everywhere. We all across the country. Did you correspond with Bob? I had to open correspondence until May of 68 when Bob closed off all correspondence for me. And I was very fortunate I was able to write the follow on it, which I took full advantage of. Like where I wanted to work and do it. He said whatever was going on. And of course, you know, write to Baba about whatever was going on in the, in the drug work. You know, the events as they occurred, and getting letters back and forth. Yeah. What, what feeling remains with you from that initial meeting with Baba? Is there something that just affects you I mean, at all times because of that meeting? Or? Well, I think I can only say that uh, it's an experience that grows more vivid as time. You know, I feel that the great good fortune that I enjoyed at that time, I continue to enjoy every time I'm invited to tell them. I get to revisit being a good mama. And, uh, you know, it's one of, it's to this day, why me? And, uh, you know, 
it's you're reading about his life, and especially as the years seemingly accumulate since he dropped his body. And it seems so extraordinary to me that you know, I was actually able to, to meet him. Just so remarkable. The only real moment in the people of my life. And I could say to me is the feeling of with certainty about his love. Certainly, if he is, he will grow strong. This is a big gift. Well, and, and it was never, it was a continuous. Absolutely. Not that I want to forget. But he has ways of reminding me. Life provides many opportunities. <laughs> but no, no. There was, there was, sure, there were, there were a lot of hard times. And, uh, you know, there, there was a, uh, in 1966, the following year, um, it's a whole story in itself, that, that Nick and his ex-wife Ursula uh, came back to the States after meeting Baba in the March of 66. Baba told them to get in touch with me when I got back to the States and we worked out to be connected in New York and then to Santa Barbara. <coughs> and then uh, on my, when I thought it was my way to go in Hawaii, I stopped this in Santa Barbara and we started talking about uh, you know, people on the road and uh, spreading out this message. <coughs> they had moved about Baba and somebody on the road had uh, seen it for me. Uh, and then we thought, we really wanted, we really wanted to go back to Asia and tell people we knew who we were traveling and we were really searching about Baba. We wrote to Baba, asking if we could do this, and Baba gave us permission. And so we, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll abbreviate this because it's, it, it's, it's a long story, but basically we, we flew back to Europe and bought a young you know, van for $50 and drove into Afghanistan. All of a sudden we had told people as we went, you know, we looked the part. We were in charge of this. We had a counter Baba, and you know, we had somebody to convey that was important. Often, meaning we just existence, of course. That didn't matter. The idea was to plant seeds of the Baba in the world. Um, you know, as he said, you, know, you just give them, he said, you give them my name. So goes from your mouth to their ear. I think it's their ear to their heart. Uh, and then, <coughs> We, Baba, we were in touch with Baba all the way along in his journey, you know, several months across Asia. Uh, and Baba told us we could not enter India. You know, we could wait until he told us we could come across to India. So we went and rented a house in Lahore, West Pakistan, 10 miles from the border, and waited. And that was the only land border between Pakistan and India. And we rented our house and uh, opened it up for any travelers, hitchhikers, coming through. Um, a lot of them we knew from our own years on the road. And we had quite a collection over the months that we were there of people coming through, some of them with huge amounts of cash. And they, just Pakistan was legal. Um, and uh, with more dark night and soul, we got to uh, tell it to old habits and wrote to Bob about it. And the great pain that Bob forgave us and said, Never do it again, which I never did. Um, but that was, it was very much about dark night and soul. Really, we disappointed Bob. And of course, he forgave us. But it was, uh, it made the lesson really. And then we, we spent uh, several more months in Asia and all came down through the United States. We also all came down with that place. That film was brought about by extreme self disgust. So, were the people that you knew in the States who were using drugs at that time, it was really in vogue, was there sort of a, a big uh, change, you know, as far as the way you looked at them? I mean, 
it, it very much so. There's a lot of, <clears throat> you see like a lot of like, one's identity is involved in terms of, and a lot of people that one knew and people were you know, using drugs that this was the, very much the social context. And then you get together with people who get stoned, somebody who doesn't, it's, uh, it brings people down. So it's, but, but I had several people who I had known for a long time before I got to the when they heard me tell about this, you know, who said that they were looked for, were looking for a reason not to take drugs. They hadn't found anything that made any difference. It made any sense. To them. This made sense. You know, so it was an opportunity to really narrate uh, what Bob's statements were, what my experience was, and leave the results to him. You know, it was, it was something that just sort of uh, built up and it sort of gathered momentum. And, uh, it really became very much an effort. You know, lots of people working together and all across the country. It was really a remarkable time. Then, sort of Did I answer your question? Yes. Does anyone else have any questions? How was the social order that they were trying to get to their face and so they could do a question on the screen? That has a special effect or significance in the world? It's like you used to be like, you think about it, like they lost it. Oh, that's right. So that's what uh, it's saying. Yeah. Because many of us sometimes are confused that they're like, we're actually yeah. mental, but you, can, you know, you said like this was his first word there. Yeah, the, yes. it, was, it was indirect. Mm -hmm. uh, because I was able to enjoy the people of correspondence with Baba, which Eric was the medium for. Baba always, if you always ended the letters with, Baba wants to take good care of your health. Which I just sort of vaguely dismissed as being, you know, the thing that, you know, we all say to each other, you know, take care of it. Be well, whatever it may be. It was a sort of nicety. But what I didn't realize until years later was it was an order. You know, Bob wasn't just being conversational, polite. Bob wants you to take good care of your health, and now my health was in the tatters. Hepatitis in Afghanistan, and dysentery, and you know, all sorts of you know, miserable things. Because you know, I didn't take care of my home. I didn't follow up. Now, of course, the doctor of Chinese medicine is going to help people with their health. But, but I had to learn to take care of my own. First over years, of, to years of neglect. Uh, and that's an uh, unnecessary suffering. I think that was that's a good question. We have listened to Bob's story, other than the more obvious ones. This might sound a little stupid, but did so. it make much of an impression in your travels? You must have been pretty tired by the time you got to sleep on that cot, but nevertheless, yeah. did it, knowing that Bob had slept on it before. It, it, was, it was all. I don't really know quite how to put it. It was, it was just a part of the whole thing, was, the whole experience was so overwhelming. Mm. I mean, I think, I think that there was, there was plenty of preparation. But no matter what the amount of preparation that I felt that I had undergone and brought with me, that nothing could equal what I was given. Mm. So it's, I mean, everything was significant. I mean, being there, being in his presence, most of all, of course, but, you know, being allowed to be there. It was, so being in the Blue Bus, I mean, the, historical, the historical significance of it, but it wasn't necessarily more or separate from anything else that you know, was there. It was all quite wonderful.
But we can't wait for more stories that, that the Sahabas... I, pur I, I purposely, <laughs> I purposely messed things up. Because those are the years you <laughs> lived, the years in the 70s, didn't you live in India? So there's stories there too. Without question. I want to make sure that you got oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Are you going to be here tomorrow? No. My, my wife's family is up near Thousand Oaks and we'll just we'll be like kids. So let me time. ask you an Easter question. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, um, what was Bob's um, take on Easter on the on the resurrection? Well Bob of course said that Jesus didn't die on the cross. He was taken by two disciples to India. Timothy and uh, Bartholomew. Uh, and that he lived out his life until the later years in Kashmir and India. And what, what was the whole, uh, so how did he explain the, the whole gospel of resurrection story? The appearance of Jesus after. I don't know. Yeah, I was thinking, I don't know if he was probably born in the air somewhere, but I don't really know. He said that, but he said it quite clearly that Father did not die on the cross. Okay. Well, thank you. 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 I think it was the suffering that the Jedi was really in the life of the Prophet. And that in itself was, was the basis of the purpose. The miracle that he survived yeah. the crucifixion. I, I will always have really, uh, I always dug uh, him uh, appearing before his promise. He probably did, though. No, I mean, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, I, I hope so. <laughs> Yeah. I don't think any man, though. It's like Baba appearing to people now. I mean, yeah, sure. you know, and when he was in the body, he would appear to people. So, yeah, I just, as Jesus, he certainly would have. So. But anyway, that, that could get us into a whole other thing. Yeah. That could be a workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. But anyway, Robert, we thank you so much. Okay, Baba. Thank you. Thank you.